So for purposes of today, I've decided to focus the discussion first of all around um, SDG 11. Um, you've had that brief introduction also. We, we know that it's the urban goal in the sustainable development goals. The first two questions will be around that and then I venture into understanding a little bit the nexus and the connection between the targets um, set in SDG 11 for sustainable urban development and what is happening at the moment in the secondary cities of South Africa. Um, a few comments on the research method in my preparation for today. Um, I focused on a, a desk-based uh, method. Um, I considered literature from um, South Africa, but also from um, abroad. And I had to look into statistics and data that's been previously captured by Stats SA, as well as the South African Cities Network. But an important disclaimer, most of these stats date to um, pre-COVID-19, which is going to be important, um, understanding some of the context later on in this presentation. Then I've had the huge benefit of access to case studies that have been conducted the past couple of years by the Centre for Development Support at the University of the Free State, which has been the main institution conducting research on secondary cities in the past decade. Method related observations that I thought the audience this afternoon might also find interesting. Cape Town, Johannesburg and Durban remain our most researched cities. Obviously, they are not secondary cities, they are metros. Um, we still have a rather limited number of scholars, um, lawyers and, and others focusing on secondary cities, um, which is a bit of a disappointment, but it might definitely change in the future. And then one of the probable reasons, which is the last point also on this slide, is that secondary cities or intermediate cities or medium-sized cities, they go by, go by all those names, um, do not yet feature very prominently on the global research agenda around cities. Um, background um, around sustainable development, the sustainable development goals as such, um, it's definitely not news for many of you, but there might be people present here that's not that familiar with the SDG framework. So during 2015, um, the United Nations General Assembly adopted 17 interlinked global goals for sustainable development. Um, they are captured in a document called the 2030 Agenda, which was ultimately designed to become a blueprint for how the world should develop between now, well, between then, 2015 and 2030, which is really not a long um, period. And they obviously followed the um, period of the Millennium Development Goals that we've had. In 2017, we've seen um, action again where the SDGs were actually made more actionable. Um, the United Nations adopted a resolution at the time identifying specific targets and specific progress indicators for each of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And since we've also seen the development of quite a number of international monitoring tools that um, countries all over the world can use for purposes of tracking progress with the SDGs and also for purposes of reporting, um, especially to the UN. So this is a familiar um, picture that you see on your screens now. It's a very colorful um, way of explaining or setting out the 17 SDGs. And um, it's, it's something that um, uh, explains in accessible and ordinary language what the 17 SDGs um, entail. So SDG 11, Sustainable Development Goal 11, is the one focused on urban development or cities more specifically. And the, the aim is to have all cities all over the world inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable by the year 2030. Now, this is certainly a very tall order. Um, it's accompanied by 10 targets and 15 indicators. So the 10 targets um, can be distinct between or we can make a distinction between outcome targets and means of achieving targets. The seven outcome targets really speak to what cities can do. Um, while the means of achieving targets speaks more to national level governments as well as the um, international community. The outcome targets are um, telling. They um, stipulate that countries should pursue um, safe and affordable housing, affordable and safe transport systems, inclusive and sustainable urbanization, 
um, protection of cultural and natural heritage, um, the reduction of the adverse effects of natural um, disasters, the reduction of environmental impact on cities, and then the provision of access to safe and inclusive green and public spaces. So these targets are accompanied by 15 indicators and on the right hand side of the slide, I've given you a sense of how a typical target sounds and, and what the corresponding indicator looks like. So the very first target in SDG 11 is to, by 2030, ensure access for all to adequate, safe and affordable housing and basic services in the upgrade of slums. And then the indicator is um, the measurable proportion of the urban population living in slums, informal settlements or um, inadequate um, housing. So how did this goal focused on cities come about? And um, almost more importantly for today, what does it mean for South African towns and cities? Um, so I think that a lot of the um, scholarship around cities and transnational um, governance or global governance and transnational um, exchanges involving cities had to do with the establishment of SDG 11 accompanied by the very active participation of global city networks um, in the international lawmaking arena, law and policy making arena. Um, and, and this emergence of cities um, on the international front as non-state actors, in other words, as non um, national government participants, um, challenges traditional conceptions of especially international law and its interaction with domestic constitutional law. And this keeps academics specifically quite busy. And there's these two competing ideas. On the one hand, the city as a creature of the state where um, cities, uh, um, countries all over the world um, regulate cities, city behavior, what should and can and should not happen in cities. But then on the other hand, you have the city as a quasi-sovereign, um, a space of limited but real autonomy with minimal state interference. And we see this understanding most promin prominently playing out where cities typically become members of international um, or global um, city networks that participate in international projects without any approval um, or even the knowledge often of the national authorities. And we've even seen the World Bank concluding agreements directly with cities without the involvement of national authorities. And this is something that's not been seen um, as recently as two decades ago. Um, we also see sub-national authorities increasingly featuring in, in changing international law and global governance architectures. Um, the Paris Climate Agreement was one of the very first international law instruments to very specifically mention sub-national authorities and their role in especially the mitigation of climate change. Um, the new urban agenda, soft law instruments, is all about municipalities and sub-national authorities. And then we see cities increasingly feature <coughs> <coughs> pardon me, in um, new international law developments around migration and um, security, also international corruption, um, international trade, public health, um, even more so with, with COVID-19, international sports regulation, um, human rights, and there are also other fields. So the general consensus regarding the purely domestic character um, of the relationship between cities and national authorities or the city and the state is increasingly being put into question. And, and I think that is, SDG 11 has been one of the results of this. Um, international lawyers and do, constitutional law scholars um, grapple with the reasons for this, the implications of this, and the meaning of new and emerging notions such as the internationalization of cities, the international turn in urban history and the global turn um, of the city and at the same time there is a new meta geography um, um, that we see with the proliferation of transnational alliances and global city networks and, and here at the bottom of the slide I have the logos of only a few of them there are many more um, books have been written about um, the activities of global city networks 
Um, these books are not necessarily about that topic, but but here you see some of the scholarship that has been engaging with with the emerging role of cities in the international um, arena, and some of the authors and editors of these books are present here this afternoon and, and might perhaps um, participate in the discussion afterwards. So like the Millennium Development Goals, the 17 SDGs are not legally binding. So it's not law in the traditional sense. Um, states are expected to take ownership of it and to establish national frameworks and, and measures for their implementation over time. Um, the SDGs give voice to the mutuality and the interdependence of development, which is um, also speaking um, quite prominently to, to international relations. Um, and the states must follow up, review and report to the UN on their progress of implementation by way of um, national level um, analyses and data collection um, and the setting up of, of reports. Um, so progress, in my view, with the um, implementation of the SDGs is very much an international relations exercise, but it's also more, as you will um, probably understand as I move through my, my presentations. Monitoring is heavily dependent um, on accessible, reliable, high quality um, and timely data and data collection procedures. Um, and there's a huge question mark about this in the South African context, to which I will return later. And I think it's important in this context that we understand that the SDGs mark for the first time, um, or it marked the first time that a UN statistical reporting mechanism includes a clear focus on sub-national governments. It was always only expected of national governments to report um, um, and, and to collect the necessary data. But with the SDGs and SDG 11 specifically, there is um, a duty on cities um, um, as such um, to also be involved um, in the statistical reporting um, processes. So the open working group um, on the SDGs um, consisted of 77 UN member states um, and they had the support of the UN technical support team as the SDGs were negotiated. Um, UN Habitat and the United Nations Environmental Programme led the drafting of the issues brief on sustainable cities and human settlements. So it's um, it's been two of the UN bodies that, that we are quite familiar with um, in the sustainable urban um, development um, context, but there were also 12 other UN bodies contributing to that issues brief at the time. The draft team had huge support from various international bodies, um, most prominently actually the, the city networks, um, but still it was never entirely clear whether or not a, a standalone goal on cities would be included in the SDGs because we didn't have a similar goal in the Millennium Development Goals. Um, and the SDG negotiation process generally generated varying views on the viability of a standalone goal. So not all countries were excited about this from the start. Um, Germany was quite excited, um, a country such as Saudi Arabia, but Australia um, and the United States, for example, raised concerns. And, and the concerns were around the artificial distinction between rural and urban landscapes that, that an urban goal would, would create um, and that there was huge benefit in rather mainstreaming cities in all of the other relevant um, SDGs. But eventually um, there was an uncontested passing of SDG 11. So it was adopted, there was an urban goal for the first time um, and it marked a deviation from what we've seen in the MD and the Millennium Development Goals where the focus was really on um, the improvement of slum areas. And um, the this uncontested passing can be ascribed to the fact that there is global commitment more and more to improve um, urban environments, not only in relation to housing, but also in relation to other aspects of sustainable development. And as is always important in negotiations of this kind, um, the language in SDG is rather vague and non-committal. Um, it borders on being nebulous. Um, as it says, cities should become and human settlements safe resilient and sustainable um, and, and also inclusive. So what's the relevance for South Africa of this goal? Um, 
most of you, if not everyone, um, on this call this afternoon will know that Africa is one of the fastest urbanizing continents, and together with Asia, Africa will make up 90% of all urbanization by um, the urbanization rates by 2050. Um, our metropolitan cities and our secondary cities in this country are growing in terms of household numbers, um, despite the fact that the fiscal space is shrinking, which is, of course, a, a huge worry. Um, and the negative impact of COVID is not even known yet. Um, our cities um, is operating in an unstable and difficult macroeconomic and political environment. And obviously, this puts the very core of the issues in SDG 11 at risk. Um, sustainability, safety, inclusivity, as well as resilience. Um, our local government sphere in this country, Mark, uh, making up, um, the cities, of course, um, is critical for ecologically sustainable development and social and spatial transformation. This, this, the um, spatial and social transformation project, um, as envisaged by our constitution since 1996. And um, in addition, we see that inclusivity, resilience, safety, and sustainability are all concepts or themes that we see the courts repetitively bringing into deciding cases that's being brought against municipalities, especially in relation to poor service delivery. And the very first of these cases has actually been the Grootboom case, um, now decided 21 years ago, um, hard to imagine. Um, furthermore, our cities in this country is, are legally obliged to be developmental. Um, it's, it's not only a policy goal, it's, it's in law. Um, the vision for cities in SDG 11 can actually be um, said to be verbatim the vision for cities and towns post-apartheid in the South African legal framework on local government in combination with the constitution. Um, chapters 2, 3, 7 and 10 um, really entrenches a lot of what we see in SDG 11, and that, of course, is the supreme law of the country. So I think it's fair to say that SDG 11 thinking is embedded in the enforceable constitutional and local government, as well as environmental law that we have in the country since um, 1996. Um, there's scholarship on this. Um, I've been writing about the synergies between SEG 11 um, and the legal framework in South Africa. Others have as well. Um, the it's just the um, um, South African Cities Network um, having done quite a bit of work on this as well. So what did we report to the UN thus far? Um, so South, South Africa developed its um, first country report in 2019. Um, Stats SA was the primary institution responsible for the report. Um, and, and just as a reminder, SDG 11 um, has 10 targets, um, 11 indicators to report on. By 2019, South Africa could only report on five out of the 11. Um, indicators, so they could only we could only report on 45% of the SDG 11 targets, um, and it's not clear which urban data is reflected in the report. And I try not to be too critical, but um, the report really just emphasizes what we've been doing in terms of the upgrade of informal settlements, and of course it's important, but it's not the only issue covered in SDG 11. Um, some attention is being paid to um, public transport improvement, but overall the report is only, there's only scant attention to detail, um, the data, how it's been collected, what is reflected is poorly explained, and in my view the information is captured with such brevity that it actually borders on, on being meaningless um, moving forward. What we see in that report, I'm not going to read all of this, the five indicators that we've reported on. In each of the instances, there's been slight improvement or there's been improvement after we've seen um, um, a decline. That's, for example, with the access to water supply um, indicator. Um, 11.6.2, you see there, the fine particulate matter in our cities was fa found to have decreased slightly. Um, um, but there was slight and there was slight improvement in the quality of air of cities. But those of you working in the air quality space will know that um, generating um, and collecting data in relation to air quality in this country is a is a huge concern at the moment due to the capacity constraints of um, the Department of 
Forestry, Fisheries and Environmental Affairs. The name just changed last week, so I'm glad that I'm getting that right. Um, but yeah, so that's what we've reported on. So why is it dangerous, but also relevant to compare South Africa and our cities against the target set in the global goal? And I'm asking this question because we should not be uncritical of SDG 11. There's various valid points of critique against and the SDGs overall and also against SDG 11 in particular. And the importance or the relevance is um, of the comparison lies in the fact that progress with the SDG implementation has influence. It's not without meaning. I mean, it influences foreign investment. This was found by um, World Bank research recently. It attracts um, capital and fosters business confidence, and it also um, um, affects international relations. So the re relevance of the comparison, I don't want to dwell on that too much. I already gave you some sense of what the benefits are, ranging from SDG 11 being um, a mirror image also of the legal vision we have for um, cities in um, South Africa. Um, to issues such as that it forces us to collect data um, and to report on um, our um, um, progress um, in terms of the spatial and social transformation project, for example, and there are co-benefits such as forging more public-private um, partnerships. But the danger of the comparison, which I'm very cautious of, lies in the fact that there's been a disregard of the unequal development and historical development trajectories of different cities all over the world in the design of SDG 11, but also different um, um, development trajectories within certain cities. And in this case, we can just imagine Johannesburg um, and um, Cape Town, where different neighborhoods even have um, different histories and, and look quite different. It's very difficult to report on the city of Cape Town um, without making some differentiations. There's been a bias in SDG 11 um, towards the formal um, as opposed to informality that is a very strong feature of virtually every um, city in South Africa and I am can be as bold as to say in Africa overall. We have the complexity of traditional land forming part of many of our cities, um, and that has not been accounted for in the design of the SDG 11 targets. And then there are issues such as the privatization of municipal services, market forces, investments, and primary interests that definitely shape the urban form, but that are often beyond the control um, of city um, authorities and, and cities. And then there's the inherent contradictions in SDG 11, where if we do want to make our cities um, more accessible, more inclusive, there are also safety risks coming with that. And, and there's been um, scholarship around the inherent contradictions of SDG 11 specifically. I'm not going to dwell too much on that. So where does our secondary cities fit? And perhaps the very first question to ask is what is a secondary city? Um, I will get to that just now. Um, we know that our country is home to 39 secondary or intermediate cities, uh, many of which aspire to become metropolitan municipalities. Um, that is very much a political aspiration, I should add. The vast majority of work in our country is, however, being done on the eight metros. Um, so we've got eight metropolitan municipalities, 44 district municipalities, and within every district you have two or three local municipalities. We have a total of 226 local municipalities, and 39 of these are classified as so-called secondary cities. And the secondary cities are subdivided in five categories. We've got large and semi-diverse, um, secondary cities, mining secondary cities, manufacturing ones, service centre ones, and then the low gross value added tax and high population density um, secondary cities. But what is a secondary city? So we have no formal legal definition. Um, the notion actually developed in South Africa from national treasuries, differentiation between the kind of support that they provide to um, cities in the country. Initially, we had 21 secondary cities and over time it um, expanded to a total number of 39. 
but we have also in scholarship some um, definitions. One of the prominent ones is that of a Canadian scholar, John Friedman. He already defined secondary cities in the 1980s, um, and, and the definition was later on expanded by the Cities Alliance. And the focus here um, in, in the definition of Friedman is on secondary cities being urban jurisdictions, performing vital governance, logistical and production functions at a sub-national or sub-metropolitan region level within a system of cities in a country. So it's definitely cities that do not have metro status, but that's um, serving important functions within a larger um, urban um, um, context. So here you see the division of the 39 um, secondary cities that we have in South Africa. Um, they are divided here according to that five categories. And I thought that since many of you this afternoon um, hail from the Northwest University, you will find it interesting to know that all three of our campuses are based in secondary cities. And um, JB Marks, actually, Puchestruem, is a service center um, secondary city mostly because of the, the university and um, the kind of services provided to the uh, by the university in the region. Here you see a map of South Africa. It was um, very recently done. Um, it comes from a report that was published only last week. Um, we see here that the majority of our secondary cities are situated in the central to, to northern parts of the country. Um, many of these are mining secondary cities and um, Limpopo, um, Polokwane, Gauteng, Northwest Free State are home to the most of our um, secondary cities. And we know that many of those provinces are also struggling with provincial level governance. So why should we be concerned about secondary cities in the SEG 11 context? Now, for me, there are five reasons. There can be many more. They assist, first of all, with distributing the urban population and distributing urban development more equally in the country. And that speaks to at least two of the targets in SEG 11 that I indicate there in brackets. Um, they are critical for the rural urban linkages, um, including development of the rural hinterlands, considering the water energy food nexus, considering food security and other issues that speaks to the interrelationship um, between um, the urban areas and, and more rural areas. They serve a critical economic role and they serve as regional service centers in, in more rural areas or um, more sparsely populated areas, which speaks also to resilience, safety and, and inclusivity. Secondary city real estate migration could lead and have led in other countries to more, reform, to more affordable formal property boom um, outside of, of the metros. We, we see that, for example, in Pochestrum as well, where people prefer living in Pochestrum while working in Johannesburg. Property is more affordable, um, schools are slightly more accessible in terms of cost, etc. So this is definitely also one of the benefits um, of, of protecting our secondary cities um, towards a more sustainable urban development future. Then um, they are internationally connected um, because of tourism. Um, George is one of the most prominent secondary cities in South Africa in terms of um, its tourism sector because of international sporting events. That's once again something that we often see in Pochistruan, but definitely also in Mbombela um, and, and quite a, a few other um, secondary cities spread across the country. Um, international commodity exports, uh, mostly also from the mining secondary cities, intellectual exchanges, that of course happens in the university towns, and um, this speaks to the transport infrastructure development, foreign investment in public space upgrading, um, and a couple of other targets in SDG 11. So how do our secondary cities measure up and how to move forward? So the research that uh, the University of the Free State has been doing um, for, for quite a number of years already show that by the end of 2021, two thirds of this country's population 
children will be living either in a metropolitan area or in a secondary city, not in the other um, smaller um, and, and um, local municipal areas. 16 million people will, will, by the end of this year, live in a secondary city. Secondary cities in our country develop naturally over decades. Um, and I found this so incredibly interesting. The, the existing case studies on the secondary cities literally read like chapters in history books. The history of the secondary cities in our country reflect the history of mining, of industrial development, and of the agricultural sector. We know also that the secondary cities are critical um, contributors to our economy and um, upping employment. They serve essential regional service pr um, provision functions, as I've um, indicated um, earlier. They provide higher order services, such as hospitals, schools, universities, retail, et cetera, especially in, um, er in those areas where these cities are surrounded by, agriculture, by the agricultural sector. 44% um, of people living in secondary cities reside on traditional land, which is not necessarily saying much per se, but we've got only 5% in 5% um, of metropolitan municipalities, um, or only 5% of traditional land is within metropolitan jurisdictions. Um, this speaks, however, to poverty levels, household level income, in our secondary cities are 35% lower than in metros. And it does have to do with, with people residing on traditional land. Um, and you see some of the figures there in the slide below. From this report um, that you see up here, published only last week, we know that by 2018, 24% of all people having a job in this country lived in secondary cities and together they contribute almost 24% to national GDP. 20% of our country's output originates in secondary city, cities, um, and it's mostly from trade in commodities such as steel, aluminium, also coal. Uh, many secondary cities depend, therefore, on volatile global markets. So there is this risk that we are trading in commodities um, that um, is really at the um, really exposed to what's happening internationally. And many of our secondary cities are not diversified um, in terms of the economies. Most of them depend on a single economic um, sector, be it mining, steel or, or coal related industries. We've seen in recent years a general shift in the employment in secondary cities. It's been mostly a decline. Um, the mining sector is under pressure. There's been job losses in that sector, but there's also lower employment on farms in the rural hinterlands. Um, and we've seen a very slight increase though in financial sector jobs in secondary cities, trade and in community services. The new provincial capitals, you see them listed there, they have attracted new business, which is um, um, a positive. But at the same time, the informal dwellings have grown immensely by 45% between 1996 and 2016, and 74% in our mining secondary cities. That, that is quite a lot um, for, the, for the period um, during which the statistics were um, collected. Less than 10% of households um, in secondary cities do not have access to electricity, and that is not too bad. Actually, it looks fairly good. Um, access to water and sanitation have in, has improved, but the cities cannot keep up, so it's not sustainable. Um, and the state of the municipal governance in our secondary cities there is a very, very strong negativity bias. I need not say anything to any of you, all of you hail from South Africa. Um, you see the press. Um, we know that it's a depressing state. Many secondary cities are currently under administration or have historically been under administration, known for um, 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 very bad audit results, known for corruption. Um, known for um, mayors as, as well as municipal managers um, being charged with um, criminal um, um, charges. On the upper side, though, 
Um, a 2018 international report of Alexander Forbes, um, which looked at um, the location attractiveness for investor benefits and returns, flagged six of our secondary cities as having the potential to become sites of future investment they um, based on what they currently have and currently um, can offer um, you see them listed there for me personally it was quite striking that none of these are um, cities um, developed around coal mining specifically so that also speaks to to the risks and the forecasts in relation to coal dependent um, development in future. What Alexander Forbes did, however, look at was market size of cities, the agglomeration of people, the agglomeration of economic activity, the openness of the local economy, the cost of labor, the quality of labor and local stability. So I think this is um, quite um, interesting and also serving to show that despite governance failures, there are other issues or other infrastructure um, elements that are attractive for um, foreign investors. So how are our cities measuring up then, the secondary cities in relation to SDG 11, considering all that I've just covered? Um, so the case studies that are available deal with many issues, ranging from the historical development of these cities to the state of service delivery, um, to the number of court cases being brought against these cities and the number of provincial interventions um, that have taken place in the recent past. So we get a good sense um, from these case studies how South African secondary cities do measure up um, against the targets um, and the indicators of SDG 11. So I initially thought that I would go into the detail of a couple of case studies, um, but time does not permit Perhaps in relation to Imagheni, I can just mention it's the Bitbank area. It's known for serious pollution um, as a result of coal mining. It's known for its labor unrests. It's known for, for um, having had huge job losses only the past six years because of the closure of Highfeld Steel and the fact that the construction of Kusile um, draw to a close. Um, it's been under administration twice the past 16 years. Um, and furthermore, there's huge health issues, quite a bit of health research being conducted in that area. Newcastle has a very sad story. Newcastle has been on a very strong development trajectory the past couple of years. It had champions in that municipality for um, local economic development. It even had one of its um, officials studying Mandarin. He physically learned how to speak Mandarin to be able to better negotiate investment agreements with um, companies in um, the Asian countries. He succeeded with that. They diversified their economy in Newcastle. But unfortunately, change of um, political leadership just saw a serious and very fast decline of the state of affairs um, in that municipality and um, many of the initial um, investors since left. Macha Beng, um, that is Valcom, the Valcom area um, in the Free State province developed around gold mining historically. Um, the picture that you see there is of two Zamazamas. Um, the, the city has really fell into disrepair, um, huge issues with service delivery, um, infrastructure failures, especially water purification works. Um, sewage is a huge problem in the informal settlements and the informal settlement is also um, growing at, at great speed. In Fulini, you will recall two years ago, the South African Defence Force had to move in to assist with the um, water pollution of the in the Vol River system. In Fulini, historically, he's been in court for um, pollution due to uncontrolled industrial activity, mostly by um, metal steel or Archelor metal. Um, the municipality is known for its political turmoil and service delivery is really problematic with um, infrequent access to water, infrequent access to um, electricity. And that is the case um, also at the moment. And it's been under administration as well. 
So a rather bleak picture, um, and I think it's fair to say that the um, seven outcome targets of SDG 11 seems to be a long shot away from the reality in our secondary cities at the moment. So some concluding thoughts. SDG 11 for me repackages um, in the form of a global normative ideal, the enforceable law that we have in South Africa and that we've had for quite some time. So benchmarking against SDG 11 um, and its targets and indicators is an, in, is an end in itself, but it also helps us to assess the success, to, to assess the success with our own transformative project um, that we find in our constitution and legal framework and in our national policies. So the excessive focus on large cities in our research and in the country's monitoring and, and reporting to U the UN, etc., is actually doing an injustice to the imminent threats in and, and the potential of our a much larger number of secondary cities. Um, secondary cities, at least in South Africa, but, but it's also true elsewhere, face significant risks um, related and unrelated to local governance collapse. And this is something that I want to emphasize. There are also other forces. The, the collapse of local governance is often also as a result of other international um, forces at play within a municipal area. And I don't want to say too much. I'm just putting the word up there, call. Um, I'm particularly worried about the secondary cities that have developed around coal mining in the past decades. Um, so the probability of the realization of the risks is definitely growing, even more so now um, in an era of, of COVID. Um, and it's going to have an imminent domino effect. We are likely to see more people moving to the metropolitan areas, um, especially um, um, migration between informal settlements. Um, and we we know that our metros are already also under pressure and cannot necessarily um, accommodate um, this influx um, from secondary cities. For me, the deconstruction of the notion of the city is, is critical for differentiation. Um, differentiation between city types um, and, and functions that they serve um, is essential if we want to make headway with SDG 11. It, it cannot be a one size fits all. And the first stop, at least in South Africa, may be the reframing of the city in terms of law. And um, those of you who are lawyers will know that our legislation speaks about the municipality. Very little differentiation made, except here and there for category A, B and C municipalities. Um, my last comment, um, and it's actually also framed as an invitation. Um, I know that there are scholars here this afternoon that work in other fields, and I appreciate your presence. Um, I think that we need extensive interdisciplinary research to even begin to understand how to initiate and maintain multi-stakeholder involvement um, in putting secondary cities on a more sustainable development trajectory. What are the drivers for sustainable urban development and a just transition as relevant for our South African context? How to meaningfully connect the urban landscape and the offering of uh, and its offering with the rural hinterlands? The fit of investment promotion plans for secondary cities with minimal risk for the environment and for our rich cultural heritage, because there, there can be some conflicts there. The nexus between the SDG 11 targets, public-private partnerships, corporate social responsibility and pluralism in local governance, especially where we have municipalities and traditional leadership in one jurisdiction. We need to understand much better how to plan for decline. And then the last point here, we need to better understand better all of it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for this insightful presentation, Prof. Duplessis. As you rightly point out, current realities tell us that we all have a stake in the fulfillment of SDG 11. <coughs> we are interested in contributing to making our cities safe, resilient and sustainable. I'm sure by now our participants have some questions and comments to share with us. I will now open the floor to, uh, for questions and comments. Colleagues, guests and members of the faculty, you are welcome to ask questions and share your comments. 
you can do this in two ways. First, you can type your question on the chat function here on Teams. Secondly, you can raise your hand or recognize you and give you the floor to address your question to Prof. Duplessis. Let us see if we have any takers. Uh, there is Unkarabile. Please proceed. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dube, for the opportunity. And thank you to Professor Anel Duplessis for such, for such a wonderful presentation. It was insightful indeed. I have, a, I have only one question, and it is as follows, Prof. Uh, several scholars argue that it is human uh, activity that is interfering with Earth system at the moment, and that cities are made by the people for the people. So, Prof, if urbanization continues at the rate it does currently, will not all cities, uh, secondary cities, eventually tend to or transition into a large metropolitan cities? Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, Felix, can I perhaps ask, would you prefer us taking a few questions or should I respond as the questions come in? Um, I would suggest that perhaps we take two or three questions and then you can answer. But for now, I will ask uh, Chantal to ask a question and then perhaps you can answer those two questions and then we'll see who else has asked and we'll give them the floor to ask. Thank you. Chantal, please proceed. Um, okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you loud and clear, Chantal. Please proceed. I think we lost to her, Prof. Perhaps you can address Unkarabela's question, and then I'll see if there is another question. Um, thank you very much, Felix. I also see a few questions in the chat um, that I'll try and respond to. But to respond to Onkrabile, thank you very much for that question. It's true, Onkrabile, we, we run the risk of our secondary cities um, um, growing quite fast in the near future because of, of growing numbers of people. Um, however, metropolitan status has to do with, with other markers. Um, so it's not only the number of people. So I think that reaching metropolitan status, um, if it was only about numbers, we would have seen more secondary cities becoming metropolitan municipalities. But at the moment, there's the requirement of um, in um, very well connected transport systems, for example, you need to have an international airport or a port at least. So many of the other requirements are not, not necessarily met by our secondary cities. Thank you for that question. Um, Felix, would you like for me to respond to, to some of the questions that I can see in the chat? Oh yes, Prof, I please do. Um, I would suggest that perhaps you address Mohammed's question he is asking if, in your view, there are any other reasons for the widespread poverty and employment in these former coal mining uh, ESCOM plant cities. Are there international experiences similar to this? How can these issues tie to the just energy transition? And also, I see there is a question by Heloise. It says, do South African secondary cities have the necessary constitutional autonomy and governing freedom in terms of law? which are required for chasing SDG 11 targets by, for example, choosing their own methods, plans, or solution that they deem fit. Um, perhaps I can also um, oh, squeeze Felix, in. Felix, oh. wait, let, let me first right, deal with proceed. those two. Thank you. Um, there are two quite loaded questions, and I'm going to respond to Muhammad's first. Uh, Muhammad, thank you very much for the question. Um, 
So we, we know that in the mining secondary city specifically, the downscaling of mining definitely had the biggest impact um, on, on joblessness um, and as a result, um, the, the escalating poverty levels. But we should remember also that in these cities, it's not only the mine itself. There are many small, smaller um, businesses um, and SMMEs that serve these mines so that when a mine closes, for example, a section, it has a ripple effect on many other sectors, supporting sectors in that very town. Um, so I think that Yes, um, the closure of the mines um, played the biggest role, um, at least in the mining um, secondary cities, but we've also seen in um, other cities such as um, Infuleni, for example, where it was the closure of um, certain sections of metal steel, or metal, so which is in a different um, sector. It's, it's steel manufacturing. Um, but then you also ask, um, and, and I think you want to hint at the fact that we need to transition away from a coal-based economy. And yes, I think that is definitely a, a factor that might not yet have had as big an impact in South Africa as it's going to have in future with the huge emphasis on climate mitigation um, and, and technological advancements away from, from being coal-based. So yes, I... Um, I anticipate that the situation um, is, is not necessarily going to improve um, anytime soon in, in our um, coal mining and ESCOM plant cities, as you mentioned them here. And you are asking, are there any international experiences similar to this? Um, they are, especially in um, other African countries, but none have a solution, if that's what you are hinting at. Um, every, everyone is more or less where we are at now, um, where we see certain sectors really just starting to, to fall flat. And um, where to from here, um, there's, there's no um, comparable experience, perhaps in, in the US, but we, there we've seen, it wasn't really secondary cities, it was more, more smaller um, mining towns around one single mine. The, our situation in South Africa is kind of different. Um, it's, it's much larger towns um, that's being affected. In, in the US, we've seen um, smaller cities or smaller towns really just hollowing out and um, they've become ghost towns, so to speak. So also there is not really a solution. We just know what, what happened eventually. Um, and then you ask a difficult question. What explains the explosion of informal dwellings in these areas and the mass sprawl? I think it's just really population growth. Um, it's it's not that people are migrating. It's just families are expanding um, and, and not really moving away um, because of there not really being other opportunities in the immediately accessible environment. Um, so I hope that that answered your question. Um, and then Felix, you also mentioned that of Heloise, which spoke to um, the autonomy of municipalities in South Africa. And I can perhaps answer that saying that um, in South Africa, our secondary cities, as all other municipalities, have a lot more autonomy, first of all, than what municipalities had prior to 1996, but also in comparison with municipalities in other parts of the world. If you look at the schedules in our constitution, many of the issues that are local government issues um, are the kind of issues reflected in SDG 11. So yes, we, we definitely, our um, secondary cities do have the necessary um, governance authority and autonomy um, to chase the the SDG 11 targets, and they have the instruments at their availability as um, at their um, disposal as well. Um, if I, I can't see it now, but I have seen earlier that Eloise mentioned some of the governance instruments that municipalities have control over, and certainly those um, can help secondary cities moving forward in terms of um, the SDG 11 targets implementation. Thank you, Prof. Um, I see that there are also some more questions in the chat function, but perhaps before I ask those ones, I can just highlight here 
um, and thank Prof. Louis Kotze for sharing us with uh, for sharing with us a link that contains your work on the role of SDGs in cities. Uh, there is a link there to chapter nine of a book. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Kotze. There is a question from Rafilwe that says, uh, would you also say that the reason for the explosion of informal settlements is as a result of inadequate planning on the side of municipalities? And then there is also a question from um, your Henry, who says, I would like to know your thoughts on the effects of the so-called negative infrastructure system that seems to prevail in South Africa, where residential buildings are erected before municipalities have laid down essential infrastructure for electricity and water supply on the sustainability of secondary cities. I think you can answer those uh, questions, Prof. And then um, after you've answered, I'm going to try and get back to people who have raised their hands. I'm going to, after this, give Chantal a question and also Kamal um, the opportunity to ask their questions. Please proceed, Prof. Um, thank you, Felix. Uh, some of these questions are quite loaded, so I would actually like to ask that we handle them one by one moving forward. I think we have enough time to do so. Um, I'm going to start with that of you, Andri. Um, so you are asking about the negative infrastructure system that seems to prevail in South Africa. Um, and, and that speaks to some uh, or the interlinkages between infrastructure where, for example, there's a new property development before the bulk infrastructure system um, being fully operational or in place or even being feasible. Um, I, to be honest, I don't, I haven't really researched this um, uh, up until now. Um, I do, however, think that it is part of the problem because you need supporting infrastructure um, for purposes of sustainable development. Um, we, the last thing we need, especially in our secondary cities, is the erection of um, buildings um, or new facilities without the supporting infrastructure. And the infrastructure is not only um, pipes and um, water storage facilities. It also speaks to the availability of the necess necessary natural resources. It speaks to the availability, the carrying capacity of, of um, the immediate land in terms of, of waste. So yes, I think that such assessments, um, they are supposed to be done, but they are um, more and more important when we talk about, um, we, if we want to see sustainable urban development, the supporting infrastructure, natural resource based, as well as physical um, built environment infrastructure equally important. Um, Felix, I, the, the other question you asked, was that the one by Andrew? Um, it, uh, I was suggesting that perhaps we can give uh, Kamerawani an opportunity to ask you a question. Okay. Rani, please proceed. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation and to everyone who's put the event together. Um, my question is, is there not a bit of a gap somewhere between SDG 11's conceptualization of enhanced stakeholder participation on one hand and then the kind of worrying trend we see around the way stakeholder participation is actually realized in a lot of South African cities, and particularly the smaller cities where either citizen stakeholders and their causes are hijacked by certain groups, whether they're formal or informal, that are interested in nothing but the money, and they'll show up with guns and demand money and leave. Um, or on the other end of the spectrum where stakeholders just get included as passive parties rather mm -hmm. than active participants in progress. And um, I'm wondering, is that perhaps not really a level of detail we can expect from international uh, agreements like the SDGs? Is that something more uh, on the shoulders of national government or subnational government to address? Um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Um, thank you very much for that question, which I think is incredibly um, relevant. So the SDGs um, are really quiet on stakeholder participation, and I think that the idea is for countries to deal with this issue as they find um, appropriate. But I fully agree with you that the trends that we've seen well, ever since the transition into a new local government dispensation are worrying. Um, we have people participating 
as you've mentioned, for for the wrong reasons, if we can call it that. But even more worrying for me is the apathy among people. It's as if people have lost um, faith in what their participation um, can possibly contribute and achieve over time. So, so the apathy part is the one thing that I'm really concerned about, especially under younger people and the next generation of decision makers and the next people to have children um, um, who will be dependent on, on the sustainability of our cities and towns. The one thing, and I, I'm not sure that even if the wording has been included in the SDGs, it, that it would have made a difference. We find that it's in the highest country of South Africa and um, participation by um, communities is something featuring in, in Chapter 7 of the Constitution. It's something that's required for developmental local government in South Africa. But I am um, optimistic in the sense that we've seen cities as lower level stakeholders penetrating the international arena, which is for me an indication of the devolution of power that we can also, if we really put our minds to it, see happening in the South African context, where the people on, on the street and those paying rates and taxes or supposed to pay rates and taxes um, permeate and, and penetrate the, the, level, the um, decision making rooms. And, and we should do that and we should encourage each other to do that. So it might not be um, something that the international developments can can help improve in South Africa, um, but I think it says something about the devolution of responsibility um, and and taking ownership of urban sustainable development. Thank you, Prof. May I please ask you to answer one more question, and then I'll hand over to Nicolene for a vote of thanks and closing remarks. Um, Andrew thanks you for this important and valuable presentation. He would like to know your thoughts on whether the impact of crime would eventually transcend to medium scale municipalities since this is common in large cities considering urbanization and other factors contributing to crime. Also, what would you believe is the desirable approach to this? Um, thank you, Andrew, for the question. Um, I try to look into the crime stats, couldn't find much other than what's being reported on what's happening in the Valcom area with the Zamazamas, um, the illegal miners. But um, as far as I could establish from the case studies that um, the University of the Free State has done, crime is thriving also in our secondary cities. Um, it might be less a matter of um, syndicate type and organized crime, but at the level of petty crimes um, and people feeling unsafe, um, it's unfortunately something that's definitely also very prevalent in our secondary cities. It might be different in some other smaller municipal areas, but I think um, since most of the secondary cities also lie on some of the main roads of South Africa, the accessibility makes it easy um, for criminals to access um, and to um, you know, to move around our secondary cities. If you think about a town such as, um, or a city such as Potjestrum, it's situated on the N12. Um, a city such as, um, um, now Newcastle, also on main roads in KwaZulu-Natal, and the same with, um, uh, and now, now I can't <coughs> think of the um, the names of the municipalities, but I think the long and the short is that um, um, unfortunately crime is already there, and I don't know how reversible that situation is. Uh, thank you, Prof. I'm just going to ask you. I know that was going to be the last question, but I'm going to ask you. I just need to confirm if you are able to answer a fearless question. She asked if you say the reason for the explosion of informal settlements is as a result of inadequate planning on the side of the municipalities. And perhaps after you have answered this question, you may perhaps share with us any final inputs that you have for us today. 
Um, thank you, Felix. Um, yes, the question around informal settlements um, is a very complex one. And I think we should be aware of the fact that the housing problem in South Africa is a problem that's the responsibility of the entire government, national, provincial, as well as local. So we can't say that it's a lack of planning only on the side of the city that is seeing um, the the huge um, expansion of our informal settlement areas. It really points to the entire government and not only to cities, but there is of course something to be said for the spatial planning um, function of uh, municipalities, which is a much a more loaded responsibility after the adoption of the Spatial Land Use and Management Act um, in 26, 2015. Um, so to feel way, um, to answer your question, um, it's a combination of, of problems and it's lack of planning and lack of resources on many fronts, not only that of cities, but cities are definitely also involved um, and, and um, part of the solution to that problem, to the problem. And um, I don't know if um, um, anyone else wanted to also intervene on that front. I know that there are housing specialists here this afternoon. Um, Felix, so I'm just checking the chat quickly to see if we perhaps missed anyone. It doesn't look like it. Um, you asked me for concluding thoughts. Um, what I can perhaps say is that I am guilty as charged in the sense that also in my own research up until now, I have mostly focused on the metropolitan um, municipalities of, of our country. Um, that is in my work that did not concern local government law as such, which obviously speaks to all of the cities. And um, it's my invitation this afternoon that that we try and also divert some of our scholarly attention to to the to the still large but smaller um, cities that we have in South Africa. And for me, this is actually some form of a round circle because just this afternoon I remembered, and if Wilhelmine is on on here, she will also recall this, that in 2004, I was part of a research project of ICLE where we had to do case studies on secondary cities in Southern Africa, not only in South Africa, but in Namibia, um, uh, Mozambique, um, South Africa. And, and that was a very interesting experience at the time. And I remember that writing up those um, case studies, it was really striking how much effort the um, medium-sized cities at the time um, put into environmental sustainability and in environmental um, protection and conservation type projects. And in none of the case studies on, on the um, secondary cities that's available at the moment, the most recent ones, there's anything on environmental protection efforts as it's as if the focus has um, uh, moved in full to social development and economic development at the cost of any focus on environmental protection. And that is a huge concern to me, um, but it also just flags where there might be a need for um, further research, further policy influence, and also just as ordinary citizens, there where we participate, coming back to the question of earlier, um, the kind of priorities that we should help um, um, to, to mainstream. Um, thank you, Felix. I, I think that's it from my side, unless anyone else, I see we've got two minutes left, has anything else to contribute? Um, otherwise, I'm just thanking everyone for their questions and participation. Thank you, Prof. Um, I should apologize if anyone would have liked to ask a question and they didn't get the opportunity. Now I'm going to hand over to Nicoline to give us a word of thanks and close the session. Over to you, Nicoline. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Prof Duplessy, for your very thorough presentation and enlightening inputs on the SDGs and our secondary cities. I really think that we all learned a lot and some very interesting insights were brought to light. So I also anticipate that the discussion will certainly not 
and here. So thank you again, Prof. It's much, much appreciated. Thank you also to Felix for facilitating this session. Uh, we really appreciate it. And then thank you to our audience. Thank you for participating, joining in and asking very valuable questions. Uh, we also appreciate you. Make sure to keep an eye open for invitations to our two upcoming critical conversations later this year. And also feel free to follow Claire's on Facebook and Twitter. You can find these details in the program. And yeah, thank you very much. See you again soon. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye, thank you. Thanks, bye.